Thomas, just tell me where you're from. Um, I'm from Bushwick Street originally. I um, grew up on Ivy Terrace. Um, that's where I was born and reared um, from 1985. That's where. What age are you? I'm 38 now. I'm currently living in Gaelia now. Did you experience any alcoholism when you were growing up? There was no alcohol in our house um, growing up. My father stopped drinking whenever the children started being born, and my mother was a pioneer all her life. Um, never any any alcohol at all in our, in our family. Like I had, a, I had a great childhood growing up. Um, my father was the, the head of a youth club in the Brandywell. Um, would have spent all my childhood in the youth club. Over the summer, we had summer camps. Um, started playing golf sort of quite early on, about nine, ten. Um, spent the majority then of my teens at City Dairy Golf Club. Um, just playing golf every single day of the week. No trauma. Um, so we locked on day whenever I'd, I'd done time in the orphans, like it was the back trauma, but nah, there's, there was none in my life anyway. Uh, trying to find back to the, the first time that I, I, I drunk. Um, it was, you know, people say you get this euphoria about you. I, I noticed that it was more of a confidence thing. Growing up, I, I had always the persona about myself that I wasn't the, the most best looking, I wasn't the most outgoing person. But that all changed whenever I had a drink. Um, turned into the most confident and cocky person that there probably was. And I think that's where from my love of alcohol and then came from that extra boost that it gave me. Um, and my self-esteem just went through the roof whenever the alcohol was involved. Like. Did that cause you any discomfort or mental health problems growing up that you were you were lacking in confidence? Looking back, now it probably did. Um, I didn't see it at the time. Um, you know, whenever I had got under my, my depths of drinking, then it sort of, the depression and the anxiety had really taken effect. And it sort of made me think back to when I was younger, when I was in my late teens. And it was the same kind of feeling. So I do think that there was a, a period there of 15 to 18 year olds that I did suffer quite a lot with depression through bullying and stuff through school, but at the time, you know, it was never talked about. Um, depression, anxiety through the early 2000s, late, late 90s, like it wasn't a thing that you, you discussed or you, you talked about. So that, I definitely think there was a connection there. But you think looking back at that? Oh, looking back. Led you to alcoholism? See, I don't think so. Um, it might have well been, but in, in my eyes, my, my alcoholism, um, was a, a gradual progression. Um, it would have started off going out a couple nights a week, um, and then my father died when I was 20. Um, from that, there was no real structure. There was no real enforcement then, and I, I think that going out then four nights a week, five nights a week, six nights a week, and then it was seven nights a week, um, drinking whenever I. I was bored, just anything to follow the days. Um, then it just it was a gradual progression then um, that led on to my drinking then for, from that. How did the alcoholism progress? See, I was told quite a lot, um, mid-twenties, going on the late-twenties, that there was an issue with my drinking. Um, I couldn't see it. I thought I was just like everybody else around the area that loved going out, loved going for pints. Um, it was only whenever I got into a, a bit of a serious relationship, I'll say a bit of a serious, it was a serious relationship, that it started to really come under effect, because I was on my own. I, I didn't really do relationships, I just sort of be myself. Um, so whenever I got into a serious relationship and we were spending more time together, I would get the edge in of, why am I not getting it from my drink? Why am I not getting it from my pints? And it turned on then hiding the drink. Um, sneaking out for drinks, sneaking off from work to go for pints. Um, and that's whenever it, it really started to take effect that I don't need to go for pints, I can hide it about the house. I can have it hidden somewhere and get me a drink. I don't need to be sneaking away and you know, I can wait till she goes to bed and have my, my foggies in. And that's whenever it had really started to, to kick in. Like I was sort of in my, my late 20s. That, that had really started to take effect then, that the, the hiding the drink and the, the sneaking about a lot had really started to come under effect. 
I used to do the same, but were you caught? All the time. About the house? All the time. Denied it. it was a mine. Um, or if she would have drunk vodka and I would have drunk beer, I would have took half of her vodka and filled it back up with water again. And then she would have said to me, fuck, it's down. It wasn't me. I don't drink vodka. No, there was always a conniving part about me. Um, sort of controlling. Um, I hate looking back on it because it was a, a, the amount of lies and manipulation that I had against somebody w wasn't somebody that I was, but it was at the same time. You know, it was one thing I learned in Northlands. I would have blamed the drink for how I was or how I acted, but what I had to take on the effect was it, it was me. That was all me. That was the kind of person that I had turned into from from the alcohol. Um, I, there, there was no denying whenever I had a drink. You could see it a mile off from me, my face. She, the partner that I had at the time would always say she could she could tell by the way I spoke. She could see it in my eyes, but I would always deny it. Make it out that, that she was lying and try and twist it and turn it as much as I could to, to deflect from me having a drink. But you must have known it was an issue. I did. Um, I had went to Northlands. Um, must be about 10 years ago now, maybe 11 years ago, and I'd asked them for help. But at the time, I wasn't, it wasn't at the point that I wanted to stop drinking. Um, I went to Northland and asked them if there was a way that I could control my drink, learn how to drink like everybody else. Um, quickly seeing that that wasn't, that wasn't an option. Um, no, I was getting non-alcoholic beers, but I was getting a half ball at the same time. And I was topping the, the non-alcoholic beers up with a half ball, like, and, you know, just that delusion that I thought I was tricking everybody around me, but it wasn't. No, it, was, it was never the case. Like fooling yourself. Fooling myself was the was the big thing. I... How did you feel when you when they was drank caught in the house? To be fair, I was gutted because the majority of times the drink was free out. Um, like whenever I went back, they they lived in my mother's house, and she would find drink about. Like she would she would throw it out, and I'd be absolutely gutted. Um, it was like, the, the way they sort of put it was like, somebody found a hundred pound of yours, took it away from you, said you're not getting it. I got feeling that, oh my God, that's gone. It's how I felt every time that that happened. Um, that's where you started to know there was a real dependency on it, that he needed it. You know, it, so it, it meant so much to me for it to be taken away all the time. Did you um, ever find yourself counting covers to get enough? Oh, all the time. Um, searching the sofas, um, anywhere that I could find money, I was looking to see if there was money there. Um, I, no. <laughs> and I think they sort of get a few pounds together, they try to get that, that drink. Uh, it was always, you were always counting. Uh, that's what I was doing, I was doing too, counting, 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 fucking disaster. The smallest amount of money. <laughs> silver. <laughs> What about the hangovers? At the end, there wasn't really a chance for a hangover. It was always, like I was waking up in the morning and I will say waking up, I wasn't really sleeping. I was just managing to get through the night. But nine o'clock, I was clock watching. They had, had nine o'clock to get to the office. Um, I never really thought I got hangovers. Never really had any sort of bad hangovers. Never really had a headache in my life. Um, so, no, I never really had an issue with hangovers. Do you ever feel the night after that you have a, that you have a need, a stronger need to have it? No, after you're drunk when you wake up, I used to feel like a bit of a vampire when I woke up. Ah. Uh -huh. It was an extra strong urge to, to take away the mental anguish that I, from what I'd done the night before. I think that's whenever I really, I was drinking nearly every day. If I hadn't had that drink, that itch, the, the irritation that you felt um, was strong. Like. No, it was really intense. That you were just sort of on edge, and you knew the only thing to stop at would have been to get the drink, and the drink would have took that away. But you see, it was it was just to get black out. The, the quicker I got black out, drink to get away from me, my own head, was was the best. Like, what type of drink did you drink? At the end, it was just vodka, vodka, like straight, more or less. Um, you no, know, a ten glass would have been two pint glasses, three pint glasses at the at a push. 
um, you were just topping it up with a bit of, bit of coke. Uh, if you had coke, look, it was, there, there was barely anything that was sort of going under the vodka. It was more or less straight vodka. Um, at the start, it was always beer. Always said, never, never drank spirits. But uh, in the end of it, it was just nothing but vodka. Like. It was the quickest way that I could, I could get blackout drunk. Like. Tell me about the pain of the day-to-day -day -day existence. I couldn't. I couldn't function. Um, no, they take away the shakes. They take away the, the cramps, the pains. Um, that I was having was I, to get that drink. Um, the worries in my head, the depression, the anxiety. You know, my, my anxiety was that fierce. If I hadn't been drinking and somebody had walked past my window, I had in the bathroom for three days and I couldn't leave. But as soon as I had that drink, I didn't care who walked past. I would have been out the window looking to see who it was. The difference that I, you know, people say it's a, it's, a, it's a medication. At that time, 100% it was my medication. I needed that drink to be able to, to function, that I thought was like a human being. Um, and that's, that was just the end of my, my day to day life. What was, the what was the tipping point that led you to, were you led by the nose and the, and the treatment or, or was, was somebody else or was it your decision? At the, at the end of, you no, know, my mother always tried um, to get me help. Um, you know, she couldn't understand the addiction side of things. Um, she'd be like, did you just stop drinking? And you know, a couple of times I broke down crying there, like, and I'm going, I don't want to be like this. You know, if I had a choice, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be an alcoholic. But at the time, you know, it wasn't a choice. That's, that's how it was. Um, at the end of my drinking, it, it, it got that bad. Like, there, was, there was demons crawling out of walls at me, you know, diving out of your bed in the middle of the night, roaring and squealing. Um, I was found out the line, um, passed out in the train tracks, and somebody had managed to get a hold to my mother. And my sisters came out to get me. Um, but I just wanted to go back drinking again. Um, couldn't see the, the harm that it was causing. Um, told them that if I wasn't going to get drinking again, I was going to go to the bridge, and they, they phoned the police. Um, I ended up handcuffed at bed, not in the Galvin Hospital. Um, as soon as I got out, wanted to go back drinking. Still that delusion in my head that there was nothing wrong. Ended up back in the Galvin about four days later, hooked up to an IV drip. Um, I had seen the mental health nurse in, in all the Galvin, and they had asked me to go to Grangewood. I had went for a, an appointment in Grangewood. Um, don't remember the appointment. Don't remember the conversations that I had. I was still full like whenever I'd done the appointment. Whenever I come home, the, Grangewood advised me that the best thing for me was to contact Northlands. I had come home and me, my sister was in the house and I told her all about the, what the appointment and what had happened and she handed me the phone, she said, ring Northlands. And at that time I knew that it, it had to be done, that, that was my next step, like I needed to get the help. And I rang Northlands. I was on the 22nd of January, 2020. Um, and that's the day I stopped drinking. And that's, you know, went on the Northlands in the, the 2nd of March. Um, and that was the start of my journey then, and they, they getting, they getting sober like. You see, I have the same stories about minor issues with the police and going into hospital and being found in various states. Do you still think about those times? Oh, I. Oh, I. Um, no, I think it's a keeps me sober. No, I think that if for me they left a drink now, they end up back in that place. It's just, it's just not worth it. Um, no, for what I have now in my life, um, the back where I was three and a half, four years ago, there, there's no comparison to it. Like, um, and they left that drink, they, they end up back there. I can't see how it would ever be worth it. Like, no, I don't think there's anything that happened in my life now that would put me back there because of a find to be able to open out and speak about how I'm feeling and what's going on and and that was all through the help of orphans as well. Um, 
knowing that they're, they're, it's okay to go out and speak to somebody. Talk about how you're feeling. Um, if I'm having bad days, that you know, I'm okay to talk about it. I'm, I'm okay to say hey, I'm having a bit of a bad time. And knowing then of how to deal with how I'm feeling is one of the big things for me to be able to help keep me sobriety. Like. All in all, what helps you stay sober? Fishing. <laughs> Fishing. Uh, no. Whenever I got sober, um, I had I'd originally contacted Gaz at Arg Fitness because uh, I thought you know, the gym and, and doing fitness was something that I would be interested in. I'd went in and played a couple of rounds of golf. Um, didn't, didn't find that as helpful. Like, and the boy that I was playing golf, we said, would you, do you want to go out fishing again? And we, we started fishing and just the getaway um, from fishing. Like, you know, my concentration the whole time I was fishing was on the rod, on the flies, the field through the line, and everything else that was bothering me was gone. It cleared your head? It was just, just gone. And then I started a group in for, for men with addiction and mental health issues um, to get them on the, the fishing. But you know, we're currently running a program now at the minute um, for men. And one of the big things that we do is we do a hypnotherapy session as well on top of that. And it, it's not to look at their past or anything, it's to help guide them in the future and change their mindset. And that's something that I've done. I've done hypnotherapy as well. But the, the fishing for me is just you know, the, what I feel and hear whenever I'm standing in the river is it keeps me, like she knew, my current partner now, if I'm having a bad time, she, she'll say to me, you need to go but do a day's fishing. And she knows the difference for me whenever I go there, when I come back, like it's, it's like two different people. Lastly, what what are your hopes for the future? Uh, to just try and help all our men find that that about a hope um, that there is a chance for recovery. Um, there's a lot of people who helped me whenever I first started my, my journey. Um, so just to try to help all our people and show men that it's it's all right to speak out. It's all right to ask for help. Like I was I was dying. I was out. There was two ways for me to go, it was to get help or die. I had prayed that I would die through many of the times, but now I'm, I'm so glad I reached out and asked for help. Um, you know, just to, to, to be able to, to speak in the comfort that knowing that I'm talking now and it's going to help, it's, it's massive. So just to be able to share that message for the other people that there is hope to be able to get sober. But also, there's a lot of people out there that are willing to help if you if you speak out. Like, that's great. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you.